So my name is Fatima Gebauer, and I arrived at the MBL as a postdoc first, and then staff scientist. I came here in 1995, mid-1995 until mid-2002, and I was in the lab of Matthias Hensel. And how was your experience at EMBL? Well, when I first arrived at EMBL, everything looked so nice, beautiful, an incredibly young atmosphere, everyone collaborating with each other. It was really also kind of heaven to me because you, everything was thought so that you got, can concentrate on the science. And what was your projects or project or projects when you were working here at EMBO? So actually I came uh, to Matthias' lab. This is kind of a nice, a funny story. So I came from another postdoc in the lab of uh, Joel Richter at Worcester, Massachusetts. So I wanted to do a project that would give me some independence to then take it with me when I would become, uh, you know, an independent PI. So I had asked uh, Ian Matai and Matthias, uh, who would allow me to do that in the lab, and Matthias said yes. So I straightforward came to the, to the lab of Matthias. And then I started a project that I, I brought with me uh, um, uh, from the lab of Joel Richter, but soon I changed my mind. Because in a conversation with uh, Juan Balcarcel, who was a young PI at the MBL that happened to be my husband, <laughs> uh, one day at dinner, uh, he was working with sex lethal, and then the idea came up, sex lethal is a protein from Drosophila that is involved in uh, X chromosome dosage compensation. So it's, it's sex determination. So if you, if you are a fly and you have sex lethal, you become a female. We uh, started to think that maybe sex lethal had a role that was not supposed to have, like sex lethal is a splicing regulator. And uh, we thought mm, maybe sex lethal is acting through these other targets via translation. And the lab of Matthias was a translation lab. I liked translation. I was a kind of translation um, amateur. <laughs> so this is what uh, I started to test in the lab of Matthias Hense. And then that gave yield to a whole kind of uh, new, I wouldn't say field, but subfield of post-transcriptional control of X chromosome dosage compensation. Yeah. So it sounds like your time at EMBL had a big impact on your future career. Uh, what, what lessons or influence did you take with you when you left the EMBL? There are many lessons uh, that one can take uh, after leaving e EMBL. First of all, in the way of working, yeah, like uh, to be really open. Uh, with your science, to talk to everyone as, uh, you know, to talk as much as you can to your peers, to l seek for help when you need it, to try to collaborate. Uh, you know, science is always uh, more fun and uh, more efficient when you collaborate with others. And to um, go straight to the point, try to be focused, yet do not lose your sight have a global view so that you don't lose your sight for uh, you know, potential you know, findings in, 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 in other fields that can really improve uh, your science. So yeah, I was, uh, I think I was well, well taught how to, how to behave later on as an independent PI when I left the MBL. And when you left EMBO, where did you move to? Uh, when I left EMBOL, I moved to uh, the Center for Genomic Regulation, the CRG Barcelona, um, as an independent PI to establish my own lab as a junior group leader. And uh, I, I was, you know, we were one of the first groups to arrive there. The, the, the CRG was just starting. And it was a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work to start this from the beginning. But uh, we are actually very proud. Um, you know, it was kind of a, a hub for very active and motivated people. And uh, we kind of contributed to build the CRG kind of EMBL style, right? 
So we have junior group leaders, senior group leaders, we have evaluations, every so on. And, um, and we also have a very uh, you know, young and dynamic atmosphere. We have an international PhD program that helps a lot <laughs> uh, to that. So I, I think hmm, if there is one place that has been built EMBL-like, this is the CRG. And then uh, that is so, so that then later on we push uh, so that, the, and, and, and Luis Serrano has a lot to do with this, and Miguel Beato, the former director of uh, CRG. Uh, so that uh, EMBL Barcelona could be established at the CRG. Yeah. Yes, so you have a, a, a neighboring EMBL laboratory now. You also have a lot of alumni who also work at the CRG, I think. Yes, we have a lot of groups. All, this, all, all of us have contributed to make a CRG an EMBL-like uh, institute, right? So, yeah, we are a, a, a house so the, of, of EMBL alumni, we have Isabel Vernos, uh, Luis Serrano, Juan Balcarcel, I mean, I could mention many, yeah. yeah. What do you think was the most exciting project you've worked on in your career? In my whole career? You, you say it can be more than one, it can be different stages, uh, just anything you'd like to mention. Well, I, I've, uh, so in, a, in every step of my career, I've always uh, worked on projects that I found exciting. So this is really a, a very difficult question to just choose one. But uh, for example, from my first postdoc in the, in the lab of uh, Joel Richter, I was studying a process called cytoplasmic pollenylation that was starting, you know, pollenylation that occurs in the cytoplasm, right? What for? Is this, is this was a new process. And it was a new process that was super important for early development. For me, development is like the place where everything happens, right? You know, seeing a cell being converted into a whole organism, you know, I thought everything that happens in nature must happen during development. And this was a new process that I was willing to study. So when I went to the lab of uh, Joel Richter, I started uh, doing this in mouse. And we showed for the first time that uh, this process was important for mouse oocyte maturation. And we cloned the first uh, CBBs in, uh, you know, CBBs are proteins that are important for this process. Um, uh, in, of, of the mouse, not the first one. The first one was from the, the uh, you know, in Senopus, was uh, cloned in Senopus by our, uh, you know, my colleague, uh, Laura Haig, uh, who was working beside me. So I was uh, doing the same for mouse. Then uh, my husband, Juan Barcarcel, got a, a junior group leader position at EMBL. So I was, uh, of course, willing to move with him, and I was looking for um, groups that would allow me to do my own thing, right? <laughs> and this is where came the story of Matthias Hensi allowing me to do that in his lab. And there, uh, you know, this uh, project of uh, the role of uh, sex lethal and translational control in sex determination in Drosophila kicked in. And, uh, uh, I was uh, very excited about that project because it opened a whole new way on how an RNA binding protein can have so many different personalities and have so many different mechanisms uh, of action. While we were working with sex lethal, we discovered other partners of sex lethal in translational control, like this protein upstream of NRAS. And hooking on upstream of NRAS, we moved to uh, CRG, where we uh, showed that this protein was really important, uh, not only in female flies, but also in male flies, <laughs> to, uh, to control uh, dosage compensation. It, it's like an RNA binding protein that by binding to uh, you know, sex-specific pa partners, can, can, can influence dosage compensation and, ex, uh, and, and, and sex determination. And uh, we then jumped to study this protein, not only in Drosophila, but in human cells, in a human cancer, 
UNR was highly conserved uh, across, uh, you know, in, 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 mama in mammalian cells. The targets were also very highly conserved. So we thought, hmm, maybe we have found in Drosophila that the protein bound a lot of targets that had to do with cancer progression in humans. So we jumped to humans to, 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 to study cancer progression. And now uh, our main motto or, uh, <laughs> you know, subject of study is RNA binding proteins, of course, as always, but RNA binding proteins that have to do with malignancy and that have to do with translational reprogramming of cancer cells. So you've had a wonderful productive career uh, of many years studying RNA binding proteins, a common theme and different mechanisms. Just imagine you were starting off as a young group leader today. Would you still work on RNA binding proteins or is there any other area of science or something else altogether that you would do instead? Well, I find so many different areas of science so exciting, you know. To me, uh, for example, the microbiome and how the microbiome intersects with uh, the human body <laughs> to really influence how a disease may evolve or how even your behavior may evolve. To me, this is super, super interesting. And, you know, there, there, there are many other, many other, so, so let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a person that likes science. <laughs> that's a, that's a, a great answer. <laughs> and there are many, many different interesting parts of science. Also structural biology, I really like it. I mean, I think structure is to, you know, a complex, what, I don't know, a sequence is to, you know, DNA or RNA, you just you, you see it, right? Uh, you know how it works, you, 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 you can infer it and, and, and all this fancy, uh, you know, cryo -EM, tomography, now in cells, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing how, how how maybe one day we will be able to see even small little complexes working in this na their natural environments. This is really amazing to me. You're very clearly a science enthusiast and you, you obviously have worked with fabulous collaborators, with fabulous scientists. What lessons have you learned that you could then share as advice to a young scientist starting off? What would be your advice to a a young group leader starting off? My advice to a young group leader is, first of all, be happy, right? Uh, be happy with, with what you do. Be enthusiastic about what you do, you know? Don't get depressed because now there are a lot of different pressures that a young PI suffers and they have this pressure to succeed immediately and to have this number one uh, publication in a top journal and otherwise you will lose your job. Uh, I would, I would, I would uh, say, okay, keep it easy. <laughs> forget about all that shit and just forget, uh, focus on your science and on the thing that excites you more. Follow your gut feeling. Um, be careful with uh, how you distribute your time, uh, focus, and um, if you can get some psychology classes on how to manage people, <laughs> much the better. <laughs> Was that something that came easily to you when you make the transition from being a scientist doing their own experiments, working in another lab, to having to manage people in your own lab. How did you find that? I found it uh, a little bit difficult. I mean, this is something no one teaches to you how to do. You do your mistakes, right? Can, can, can someone teach you? you? Can, I mean, I remember EMBL had a course on leadership, at least something you can get from there, but then you need to apply it to your everyday life. It is not easy. And uh, you know, I'm a person that like people. <laughs> It, and I, and I, I, I tend to be, I, I am very organized and I, when I have a problem with someone, I take that someone, I tell directly what the problem I have. And that has helped me to maintain, um, you know, a nice atmosphere. So people know what I expect and I know what people expect from me. That I think that is a very important thing. But this is something you don't learn 
you know, when you're, when you're a postdoc. You, 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 yeah. you, 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 you learn as you, as you ride, as you say. You learn how yeah. to ride the horse as you ride. It would be nice that there would be more courses on how to do that because it's a completely different thing. Uh, and also, the, the level of management that you have to do, not only of your group, but then you suddenly receive you know, requests for every type of thing in addition to your you know, science on the bench. I would advise not to go too quick into that. Just you know, have a solid group first before you jump to the management. Mm. So one step at a time. Yeah. yeah. yeah and perhaps mentorship programs can also help where more experienced scientists can help younger starting yeah. out ones. Yeah, and that's, that, that mentoring programs can help a lot. And this is why when Nus asked me when I was starting my chairing of the EMB Alumni Association, what would be what I would want to do, uh, I, I would say, you know, a mentoring program <laughs> would be a very useful thing to have. You know, here at uh, EMBL Alumni, we are a huge community of people dedicated to many different types of jobs. I think getting these connections and getting this mentorship program will help a lot uh, the community. And I'm very proud to say that that mentoring program uh, there was a pilot, and now it has kicked off. Uh, yeah, we have it. That's, that's a fantastic uh, tribute to the, the work that you've done. But you, you raised the, uh, the fact that you are the chair, or the chair just in the process of retiring, um, uh, who has led the Alumni Association. Um, can you tell us a bit about your experience in working with the Alumni Association and, and being the, the chairperson? I think uh, I just loved it, but I just loved it, uh, you know, chairing um, the AMBL alumni board. I mean, it has been a very pleasant and rewarding experience because, uh, well, first of all, the AMBL alumni um, association officer, Nush, and all the, the rest of the people in the office, I mean, it's, 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 they're really great. They are very motivated. They are very organized. They, they, they have all these things that they, 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 they look for the ways of, uh, of uh, getting what uh, they want to get. And they, they are the ones doing most of the work, right? And then as a chair, uh, they, this facilitates a lot your, your job. And the, and the board is always uh, composed of people with so many different points of view. It is really very enriching and, again, super motivated. So that makes everything easy. You know, you, for example, <laughs> Angus, I mean, you, you were a chair as well. And, and you're now, you know, leading the EMBL cafes, leading all these other ways of, of, uh, of getting us connected. That, uh, I mean, it's your, you're a person to admire. It's, it's, really, it's really great. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we do it. I, I've certainly done it because, first and foremost, it's fun. Um, it's a great opportunity to remain uh, in contact with lots of the uh, colleagues that I, I, I had from my time at EMBL and beyond, and also to meet new colleagues and, and share experiences. And I'm getting to the stage of my career where I also feel some uh, pleasure in maybe giving back something to the community after uh, many people helped me uh, at different stages of my career, and I, I suspect you feel the same way. Yeah, exactly the same way. I mean, EMBL has given so much to me that, you know, I feel just happy giving back to EMBL what I can, even if, if small, you know. And it's a, yeah, it's a very exciting community to be part of. Uh, I feel I learn a lot from doing this and, and helps me to, like you, be an enthusiast for science and learn about, learn about new things. What would you like to see happen in the future at EMBL and in the Alumni Association? Well, um, I think the, the Alumni Association and EMBL are evolving towards being more and more integrated in the world, if, if so to speak. No? So I remember when I was a postdoc here um, that EMBL was 
kind of cracking out. So from, from, from just dedicating uh, time to science and the projects and blah, 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 I remember Celsom being uh, built, the uh, Science and Society office being built, like uh, EMBL opening towards the exterior, almost, kind of. Um, and this has uh, flourished now. I think in the future now with all this, uh, um, you know, the trek and all the EMBL, uh, you know, getting into ecosystem uh, research and uh, climate change and all the stuff. So I think uh, this is a, this is a, will be a very fruitful uh, direction. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree. I think trek's a, a wonderful example of, uh, seeing how EMBL can also do more outreach and more engagement. Uh, I worry sometimes that um, as scientists we don't engage enough with the public and your enthusiasm for science is, is wonderful and uh, that's true of many of our other colleagues as well and I think it's really important to communicate to the new generation of uh, young people that science is important but also really fun and really tried to get them interested in, in becoming scientists. Yeah, because the kids today are our future, right? Exactly. And they are the scientists of tomorrow. We need to keep nourishing this uh, enthusiasm for science and this appreciation of basic research, exactly. which is sometimes forgotten by the political hierarchy. So we, we need to really make the public understand why basic why is basic research important no exactly they yes. need to know and we need to keep generating this uh, it's enthusiasm. yeah we need to keep communicating that enthusiasm because basic research excellent basic research is so important because we just don't know what we need to know and so we should have smart people doing exciting interesting things without worrying too much about exactly which direction it takes you and that's the way to have new discoveries and breakthroughs in areas you couldn't even imagine yeah yeah i was just at the imaging center i had a visit you know a guided tour i hadn't visited the imaging center before and i was super impressed because you have you know you integrate the you know public with the real scientists working there on the electro microscopes that are there they can go and see people working, no? Yes. And, and how, how, how an electron microscope is and what can you get out of all this? It is uh, really very interactive. I, I think it's uh, really great. great yeah, no, I think EMBL has a great catalytic role to play in Europe in training scientists, in uh, teaching them how to be good scientists and just uh, uh, providing a, a, a pathway for innovation um, and communicating that excitement. So it, we're coming to the end of a discussion. Um, if I was to ask you to think of one thing when you look back on your time at EMBL, what would be the memory or, or several memories that would most readily come to your mind? No, first of all, how easy everything was at EMBL. That is my main uh, thing, no? I remember I got pregnant, right? I, my daughter was born here in Heidelberg and there was a kindergarten right there. I remember my, you know, doing experiments and when I, uh, I had my little daughter in the kinderkrippe and then when she was hungry, I would just receive a phone call. Come, you need to breastfeed. I was just, okay take my <laughs> lab coat out, go there, breastfeed, come back. I could go to the kindergarten in any free time that I could have to see how my daughter was doing. That was for a mother. You know, this is a luxury. This is really great. Uh, every, yeah. you know, working center should have an associated kindergarten, yeah. especially if you want to attract young people, yeah. right? So this is, uh, the, from that to, um, you know, um, how easy it was to connect with people. I remember I was at the Gene Expression Program, was called, now, now it has a different name, but it, before it was called the Gene, Gene Expression Program, uh, headed by Ian Matai. Yeah? 
And uh, we had this, uh, you know, policy that if one goes to a meeting, then when you come back from a meeting, you give kind of a summary of the meeting for the whole program, right? So we had gone to this Cold Spring Harbor meeting translation where um, the structure of the whole ribosome was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, came out for the first time and how the, the, the RNA in the large ribosomal subunit, you know, that the, uh, the ribosome was the ribosome, yes. the proteins were yeah. just there yeah. to keep the catalytic center in the right place. So um, when I came back, I tried to explain that uh, very graphically, taking, you know that Ian had hair, long hair, <laughs> taking uh, Ian's hair as the, you know, the RNA from the large ribosomal subunit. And then I had said, okay, the ribosome, the ribosome has two subunits. The brain, which is like the small ribosomal subunit that recognizes RNA and you know, all the where tRNA, mRNA, uh, colon anticolon base pair happens. And then the stomach, right? Which is the large ribosomal subunit. So imagine Ian's head is the stomach of, you know, it's the large ribosomal subunit. I don't think he liked that very much, but. <laughs> and then I was putting these little clips on his head, you know, to simulate the proteins. I mean, I have to say he had a lot of patience with me. But yeah, the next day, people laughed a lot. And the next day, he had cut his hair, <laughs> like <laughs> almost completely. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very funny. So, but the point, why am I saying this? Because he was the director of the department, right? The, the, the head of our department. And he was, uh, you know, fine to be um, you know, manage like that, you know, instead and of why an not? example of a stomach <laughs> of the ribosome, you know. I will think on that next time I see Ian <laughs> and look yeah. at him. Maybe he remembers that, yeah. I don't know. I bet he does. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it's just the friendly atmosphere all over the place and the highly collaborative atmosphere. I've had a lot of collaborators from UNBL that have shaped my career. I mean, not only Matthias, of course, who was my mentor, but also, you know, Peter Becker. I have papers with Peter Becker, Michael Sadler. I mean, uh, it's, it's really a community you can count on. Yes, you, you've mentioned some of the people that I collaborate with <laughs> at the moment, like Michael Sadler and Juan Valcarcel and, and many others. And I think that's another wonderful aspect of being part of this community that uh, we all appreciate. It's been great speaking with you, Fatima. Thank you for thank you. sharing the time with us and thank you on behalf of the whole community for your excellent service to the Alumni Association. Thank you. Thank you for being there and for doing this interview. Yeah.